Welcome back everyone to another episode of Space This Week. Every Monday I bring you these videos so that you can stay in the loop about all things space news. And what a crazy week it has been. An eclipse down under, a successful technology demonstration mission from India, SpaceX launched their second ever Starlink V2 mission, Ingenuity celebrated the anniversary of its first ever Martian flight, a successful spacewalk for Expedition 69 aboard the International Space Station, and uh, I, I think some rocket launched from Texas or something. I don't know. Anyway, all of this and more. Let's kick things off. Alright, alright, I'm of course being facetious. There's no point ignoring the 120 meter tall stainless steel elephant in the room. After literally years of waiting, the world finally bore witness to the first ever Starship orbital flight test. And while it may not have been quite as successful as we might have dreamt, SpaceX's guarantee of excitement was well and truly upheld. We had, of course, initially hoped to see the rocket launch on Monday, but that was scrubbed due to a faulty pressure valve. Another attempt was made on Thursday, and all seemed to be going well until we suddenly had a countdown hold tantalizingly close to ignition. We endured what felt like hours of waiting, in reality of course it was just shy of 5 minutes, before, yes, countdown resumed. And when T-0 seconds rolled around, those engines lit up the ground. For a split second, it looked as if the rocket was still being held down, but then, yes, Booster 7 and Ship 24 left the launch pad, as well as most of the launch pad. Look at all that debris flying up into the air. If that doesn't look too bad, then, well, check out this footage shared later on by SpaceX. The easiest way to see the sheer magnitude of debris raining down around the launch area is to watch the water. Wow, that is a lot of shrapnel being thrown a long way from the pad. We'll come back to the destruction of stage 0 in a second, right after we cover the destruction of stage 1 and 2. <laughs> yep, although Booster 7 saw a few Raptor shutdowns on ascent, probably not helped by all that concrete flying up, the rocket seemed to be ascending nicely. We did see what appeared to be an explosion of the hydraulic power units fairly early on, which is bad, since these needed to allow those central engines to steer the rocket. Disappointing, but not a major incident, considering that this system doesn't exist on future versions of Starship. Booster 9, the next in line to flight, is the first boost to use electronic thrust control instead of relying on hydraulics, so not too bad. As the massive rocket continued to ascend, hopes were high that we would at least see second stage separation and watch Ship 24 sail free of the Super Heavy. Sadly, all we could do was watch and pray as the Starship failed to separate from the lower stage. The rocket started to tumble in the sky, which of course is not a good thing, but it's definitely seriously impressive that the structure appears to be withstanding this incredibly forceful flight diversion, before SpaceX activated the flight termination system for both the booster and then Ship 24, finally closing the book on these vehicles that we've all been watching so closely for so long now. And while SpaceX's streams are nice and all, I can't not show you the footage that Everyday Astronaut and Cosmic Perspective captured. This is amazing. You can see the termination system literally zip up the booster from bottom to top. This is only a preview shot that I'm showing you. Tim and Cosmic Perspective will be releasing more 4K footage very soon. I've put links to both of their channels in this video's description so that you don't miss out on any of this. So enough about the damage to stage 1 and 2. What's up with stage 0? Well. It ain't good. <laughs> the biggest casualty, no surprises, was the launch pad. While the table itself looks visually intact, I am not an engineer, <laughs> the ground beneath it, or rather now lack of ground beneath it, tells a different story. Yep, there is now a giant crater beneath the launch mount. Look at that foundation damage. This is... I mean, this is going to be a monumental repair job. Major components are going to need to be ripped out and built from the ground up, including the literal ground. There's a reasonable chance that, at worst, the entire mount is going to be torn down and possibly replaced with the launch ring that's currently located at Hangar M at Cape Canaveral. Expect a months long repair process with this. I imagine any major damage to Mechazilla will become apparent as the site begins to open up throughout the week, although visually looking at it, it doesn't seem to be too badly damaged. Elon Musk did jump to Twitter to say that teams have been working on a giant water-cooled steel plate to go underneath the launch mount, and the destruction to the pad only happened due to SpaceX severely underestimating the power of the Raptor 2s. He then stated that the next launch will be ready in one to two months. 
Yeah, I I'm sorry, but there's no way that I believe this. <laughs> Honestly, I think we will be extremely lucky to see another launch this year, much less in a few months. And it's not even the launch mount. Look at the state of the tank farm. Those outer shells are definitely showing a lot of dents. It's not completely clear if the inner tanks have been punctured, but honestly, I would be very surprised if there was no internal damage here. Hoppy still stands, though it's definitely had some of its outer metal stripped away. But I realise with all of this that I'm being very negative. This was still an amazing launch to see. I feel incredibly blessed that I could watch this live as it happened. My heart was in my throat, let me tell you. And SpaceX definitely put on a show. And despite the fact that it launched without all 33 Raptors working properly, Booster 7 is now the single most powerful rocket stage ever flown, finally dethroning the N1 rocket after 54 years at the number one spot. Now, SpaceX need to gun for taking down NASA's SLS and Saturn V for the title of most powerful rocket to reach orbit and rocket with the highest payload capacity to reach orbit. SpaceX themselves seem happy about the launch, putting out a statement that Starship put on an amazing show with its first fully integrated flight test, acknowledging the unfortunate hiccups during the test with multiple engines cutting out and the ship losing altitude and tumbling. But you know what they say, you learn from your mistakes. This flight test taught SpaceX a lot about the vehicle and ground systems, which will help them improve on future flights of Starship. They also gave a big thanks to their customers, Cameron County and the community for their ongoing support. And a huge congratulations to the whole SpaceX team for an exciting first flight test of Starship. While Starship still has some work to undergo, Falcon 9 can continue as SpaceX's old reliable. And it saw another successful launch last week with mission Starlink Group 6-2. This launched from Cape Canaveral Launch Complex 40 on the 19th of April, carrying only 21 Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit. The reason this number is so low is because these were Starlink V2 minis, which are scaled down versions of the full-size V2s, which are only launchable on Starship. But don't let the name fool you, these are still significantly bigger than Starlink V1. The V2 satellites feature many upgrades over the V1s. The Starlink V2 satellites have useful bits of data almost an order of magnitude better than Starlink 1 in terms of communications bandwidth. So how do the V2 MIDIs compare to their larger V2 counterparts designed for Starship? Well, according to the formal regulatory filings made by SpaceX to the FCC, the V2 and V2 Mini have different form factors but are technically identical. Another change from V1 are the thrusters on the V2. Developed by SpaceX engineers, new Argon Hall thrusters will be used for on-orbit maneuvering. These have almost two and a half times the thrust and one and a half times the specific impulse of the first gen thrusters. This is only the second time that SpaceX have launched V2 Mini to orbit, following the successful first launch that happened towards the end of February this year. Over to India now, which of course means another video of Hurricane, our cat. Everyone wish him a happy birthday in the comments section below as he turned seven years old this week. And hey, while you're down there, drop a like on the video if you're enjoying it so far. It really helps me stay above water in the tides of the ever fickle algorithm. And if you're not subscribed, then you're missing out on weekly space news updates and two KSP videos every single week. So definitely hit that button and ring the bell to stay up to date. Later this week, I'll be uploading a very special KSP video. But enough of that, let's get back on track. On the 22nd of April, the PSLV CA blasted off the pad from the Satish Darwin Launch Center, carrying two payloads to low Earth orbit. The primary passenger was the Telios 2 observation satellite from Singapore-based company Agile Space. The secondary payload was the Loomlight 4, built by the National University of Singapore, the latest satellite in their STAR program, which focuses on advanced satellite systems for formation flying, with small satellites that allow for better communication and environmental sensing. Currently, STAR is aiming to fly five satellites, Loomlight 1 to 5, which will demonstrate advanced technologies like intersatellite communication and precise navigation. Recovery teams successfully recovered the SpaceX CRS-27 Cargo Dragon. I talked about this spacecraft's departure from the International Space Station in last week's episode, and it's great news that this is now home and dry. One of the more exciting payloads that it brought back from the station was frozen dwarf tomatoes that'll be closely examined for their effects on fruit production, microbial safety, and nutritional value. In additional Space Station news, two Russian cosmonauts embarked on a spacewalk last week, moving a radiator from the Poisk module to the Norka Science module. And during the spacewalk, we could see the European robotic arm in action. This was the first of three planned spacewalks for Expedition 69 Commander Sergei Prokopiev and Flight Engineer Dmitry Petalin. The second spacewalk is scheduled for the 28th of April and will involve the preparation of the space station for continued solar array upgrades. 
Check this picture out. This is a photograph of NASA's Ingenuity Mars helicopter, which was snapped by the Mastcam Z instrument aboard the Perseverance rover during the rover's 766th Martian day. The helicopter made its first flight on Mars back in April 2021, and this is the best view that we've gotten of it since then. You can even see small diodes sticking out on the top of the solar panel, which has collected some dust. If you look really closely, you can see Ingenuity's 13 megapixel camera that it uses to capture terrain on the horizon. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> I recently covered the incredible journey of Ingenuity on space this week, so I don't want to rehash old ground, but given that it has so outstandingly proven the validity of flight on the Red Planet, it makes me very excited for the future. NASA is already looking into future missions for Mars helicopters that can explore the Red Planet in ways that previous missions never could. Our friends down in Australia and Southeast Asia were treated to a total solar eclipse on the 20th of April. Check out this awesome picture of it, which was taken from Exmouth, Australia. During a total solar eclipse, the moon passes in front of the sun, revealing the sun's outer atmosphere, or corona. In this image, you can see the corona as white streamers extending away from the sun. That pinkish peak-like feature on the lower left side of the corona is called a solar prominence, which is a tall structure of solar material suspended above the sun by magnetic fields. If you're excited about total solar eclipses, which you should be, <laughs> then make sure to mark your calendars for the next one on the 8th of April 2024. It'll cross over Mexico, the United States, and Canada. Laon Aerospace had another busy one last week. We launched not only a micro-scale Apollo mission, but we also launched and landed our very first Juno colony in Kerbal Space Program 2. Click through to the channel if you're interested in seeing either of those, or there's a good chance that they're on screen right now. What's definitely on screen are the names of my generous Patreon and channel members. It's their amazing support that allows me to keep on making these videos for you all, so massive thanks to everyone there. And thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed the flight, and I'll catch you in the next one.